Hello and welcome, it's time for Bonus 42. For the gameplay this week, I have the return of a classic. Some Titanfall gameplay, because they've added a PvE mode called, what's it called, Frontier Defense. And it's pretty good fun, but then Titanfall always was pretty good fun. And you know that this new update and all the DLC they've added, it's kind of making me want to go back to the game just to finish up Gen 10. So I might actually do that, we'll see. Anyway, this time next week, the next Call of Duty will be out and, well, I'd better get my skates on with the videos that I'm working on now. Just think, if it wasn't for the bonus, I'd be able to carry on working. But no! Gotta do the bonus, gotta answer your questions. Captain Gilfeed says, Did you go Spartan or Survival Mode? Uh, talking about Metro Redux, which was the gameplay last week. Uh, I went for Spartan Mode first time around. Second time around, I'll go Survival, don't you worry. There's achievements for both, you see. So I figured I'd, I'd do the easier one first. Entertainer says, Stu, if you were forced to study a degree, what subject would you choose? Probably Escapology. Steven Svensgaard says, uh, Listen to James Portner from Extra Credits at a library near to where I live. And he made some points about Activision running series like COD and Guitar Hero to the ground, so that opposing publishers like EA also won't make any money on similar titles. Interesting thought. So, question. James Portner and Extra Credits. Thoughts? Heard of him and the channel? Like him slash it? Uh, with regard to Activision running things into the ground, I think it's kind of possible to construct a conspiracy that, you know, they're doing it to shut out EA, but really it just makes good business sense. You know, if people are interested in Call of Duty today, then it's likely they'll be less interested in five years' time. So you need to maximise the return during the interest period. And what do you know, yearly releases turn out to be a fairly profitable way of doing that. So it's business sense, it's not some sort of conspiracy to shut out EA. Extra credits, I like. I think the voice is stupid and I wish they'd drop it completely, but I do like discussion in video games, even if I don't always agree with what they say. So yeah, definitely wouldn't swap in for another Let's Player, that's for sure. Joe McLaughlin says, uh, do you ever respond to comments? Man, you suck. Thanks for your brilliant and insightful comment, Joe. I only wish all of my comments were as brilliant and as insightful as yours. Aki40FF says, Stu, have you played the Fear series? If so, what are your thoughts about them? I personally was disappointed with Fear 3 trying to be too much like all the other mainstream FPS games, and that's what killed it in my opinion. Oh, I have played Fear. I haven't played much of the first one, which is a shame because it's the most interesting one. But I have completed Fear 2, and I think I've completed Fear 3. Yeah, it definitely seems like the first one's one of the more interesting examples, because it came out in 2005, and it's kind of untainted by the, the Call of Duty influence. Also, its lighting and, and sort of real-time shadows are quite nice. Oh, as a side note, games that put full stops in between their letters, like Fear, or F-E-A-R, and Stalker, or S-T-A-L-K-E-R, they can go fish as far as I'm concerned. What a terrible way of naming a game, having all those dots in there. What a pain! Vicarious says, Do you think it's your voice that made you famous? Well, my voice is an important part of my videos, but I would like to think that it's not the only reason that I've found some success on YouTube. I mean, I do put some effort into, you know, other aspects. The writing in particular. I'm proud of some of the writing that I've done. And I'm always looking for ways to improve on that front, particularly in terms of video structure and that sort of thing. But, you know, if you want to attribute all of my success to my voice, then, yeah, fair enough, whatever, don't care. I'll just keep on making videos, shall I? The Comedian says, Hello, Stu. You are talking a lot about FPS games, but what's your favourite third-person shooter? Ah, uh, third-person shooter. Ooh. First game that comes to mind is Gears of War, and I like Gears of War, but I'm sure it's not my favourite. What else is there? The Last of Us? That's technically third person, isn't it? Well, it is third person, is it? A shooter? Kind of. Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. Oh, I did like that one a lot. You shoot, it's third person. Yeah, that counts. That might be my answer. Uh, more recently... Oh, Plants vs Zombies Garden Warfare. That was more fun than I'd like to admit. Sean Robinson says, Hey Stu, is Metro Redux any good? Yeah, it's pretty good. I can uh, I can definitely recommend it if you have a next-gen console and you haven't played either Metro 2033 or Last Light. 
James Byrne says, uh, We all know that you are covering the likes of the next Call of Duty, some more iconic arms and retro hoy games, but are there any immediate or on the whiteboard plans for games like Evolve, Destiny, Far Cry 4, or maybe a cheeky episode on something like Five Nights at Freddy's, or even a brief history of horror? I do have some ideas that are fairly likely to make it to, uh, to my channel. One of the things that I want to do is a review of the year. Because I, I think my style would do it quite some justice. Kind of a, a month by month recount in a documentary sort of style. Also, talking about more recent events gives me a chance to be, uh, I, I want to say snarky, but I don't really mean like mean snarky, I just mean slightly more topical and a little bit more political than I normally get. I mean, I, I couldn't, for instance, talk about 2014 without mentioning the whole Gamergate thing. I'm not going to go too deep into it or anything like that. I'm certainly not going to... I'm going to remain fairly neutral on the issue. Because, you know, my reputation is at stake here. But I do think there is the potential for quite an interesting and amusing recap of, of what came out this year and, and what happened. It's all part of my plan to get Charlie Brooker's job. Anyway, what else? Uh, I do have a plan for a special, a movie special. I'd love to do, like, a documentary exploring a single movie and all of the video games that that movie has inspired. Talking about uh, Half-Life and how Alien influenced it made me realise that Alien has touched an awful lot of video games. Not only are there a bunch of Alien-inspired video games in and of themselves, you know, stuff like Alien Isolation that came out recently, all the way back until, uh, you know, the first Alien film release, I mean, you've got stuff like Alien Breed, which was basically a rip-off. Metroid, which is basically a rip-off. Taito's Space Gun, all sorts of Alien-inspired. There's a whole bunch. I could really, you know, I think I could have quite an interesting insight. I mean, even Call of Duty is heavily inspired by aliens. The quotes, you know, like when um, Gaz whips out his shotgun and says, I'd like to keep this one for close encounters. Straight from aliens. The fact that Captain Price smoked cigars, that's that kind of senior officer smoking cigars trope. I'm pretty sure that started with aliens. Space Marines in general became pretty popular after aliens here. We probably wouldn't have games like Doom if it wasn't for the alien films. And then there's stuff like motion trackers, you know, which inspired stuff like Modern Warfare 2's heartbeat sensor. And then even like minimap and radar, that's probably got some inspiration from that. So yeah, I mean, loads of stuff to talk about as far as alien influence is concerned. I might have to do a trilogy. Or make it a multi-part special, something like that. Anyway. So yeah, not just Alien either. Um, there's a whole bunch of films that have been pretty influential. Obviously Star Wars comes to mind. The Matrix. Uh, Jurassic Park, to an extent. Obviously there were a few Jurassic Park games. And uh, games like Turok as well, I think they kind of came from th that sort of dinosaur influence. Dino Crisis. The Terminator films, Robocop, yeah, quite a lot of films like that, you know, they had not quite as sizable as Alien, but still, nonetheless. So yeah, an exploration of cinematic influence is a potential for a special, and I guess the first one probably will be on Alien. So I might slip that one in after I've done the Iconic Arms, or I don't know, I don't know, I'll, I'll do it as I see fit. It's probably going to be a fairly ambitious project, so it will take me two or three weeks to complete, I think. But, could be pretty cool, anyway. I also have another retro series planned. This is kind of a special series, I think there's going to be eight parts. And I can see this one being, as far as view count is concerned, I can see it being very, very successful. Because I can easily frame this one with quite a buzzfeedy title. Which I, I don't generally like doing, but sadly, having a clickbait title really works on videos. But don't worry, don't worry, um, it's actually a pretty solid video concept and I think it'll be quite interesting. But that series idea, I'm going to keep under wraps for now. It's the sort of thing that's going to cause a lot of arguments as well. Which I'm not looking forward to, but... It, like I say, it's a platform that I think will be fairly popular and it also gives me a chance to, to have some serious insight on some of the most important games of video game history. What else have I got? Oh, I've got kind of a loose concept about the contemporary depiction of war. That is to say, video games about a war that was taking place at the same time that the video game was made. Kind of a weird angle, but things like Missile Command, like, that's a game about the Cold War that was made during the Cold War. And stuff like that is fascinating to me. 
And I could look at stuff like, you know, even Call of Duty and Medal of Honor, the recent ones, uh, how they sort of feature contemporary war. And, you know, we can talk about the treatment of of how forces are displayed, how, you know, the opposing forces dehumanized, that sort of thing. How they tend to be sort of quite patriotic, aggrandizing of uh, blue forces. Oh, I don't know, I, I might be a bit boring, that video. A bit, a bit too serious, a bit too political, a bit too ephemeral. But it's an idea, it's an idea. It could happen, maybe. But yeah, I, I try to keep an open mind. I, I try and discover potential new ideas as I go through the series that I have planned. And then every so often, I'll, uh, I'll try a few of them out. I'll do some pilots. And hopefully, you know, in the future, maybe when Iconic Arms is sort of past its prime, maybe I'll find something else. I think if you're looking at this content creation lark uh, long term, then you do need to invest in sort of potential future series. You can't just bank on doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, if I did that, I'd be stuck with Call of Duty. And when that died, well... Anyway, those are my ideas. Copyright Stu, please do not steal. Bonoichi says, Hi oh, Stu, if you could have one box of biscuits for free, any type or brand, what would you choose? Now, you see, I, I am a man of moderate means, but I can go into a supermarket and I can buy any biscuits that I want without too much fear of breaking the bank. Like, a, a pack of Tannock's caramel wafers is like £1.40 or something. I, I can afford that, that's, that's okay. But when you say to me, you can have any biscuits in the entire world, I'm starting to think, well, it seems like a bit of a waste just to, you know, I'll have a box of obnobs. So I'm thinking the most sensible option is to is to find the, the finest biscuit craftsmen in all of the land and have them send me a, a box of artisanal biscuits, finely made with the the finest honey and and chocolate from only the finest of sources. But uh, you know, hobnobs would be fine too. Oh, I'm moving target three. He says, what is your desktop background? I'm actually using one of my Retro Ahoy gradients. Uh, I call it Retro Ahoy Sunset. There it is. Simple, warm, nice. I normally just go with a plain colour or something. I don't really like detailed backgrounds. Shawani GT says, Hey Stu, with a new COD just around the corner. Which console will you use to supply the clips for your still undecided weapons of advanced warfare vids? I'll probably stick with the Xbox One. Uh, bearing in mind my recording setup is limited to 720p. Although I can do uncompressed 60 frames a second. Do you know, I was hoping YouTube would get their act together and actually enable 60 frames per second on, on my channel. Because the Advanced Warfare stuff was going to be the first one that I'd actually try working at 60 frames a second. But I'm not sure if that's going to be a thing by next week, so... I don't know, I might still render them at 60 frames a second anyway. So once my channel is enabled for it, maybe it'll work then, who knows. RVB fan says, For your Retro Ahoy series you have planned in 2015, do you think your scripts will get repetitive, seeing as you're covering very similar games, i.e. Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Duke Nukem? I have considered this, um, but I do think by focusing on a different facet, I can avoid repetition. For instance, with Wolfenstein 3D, I'll probably talk about the early technology more. I'll focus on the, the origins of FPS and ray casting more. With Doom, I'll probably talk about Doom's own influence and, you know, its popularity. I'll focus on the present for Doom, the past for Wolfenstein. And for Quake, I might focus on the future and, you know, the, the transition to a full 3D world and maybe the impact that Quake had in terms of game engines. I mean, even games like Call of Duty run on modified Quake engines, so Quake has definitely had quite a lasting impact there. The same can be said for Unreal too, so I guess, I don't know, well, I'll find a way of, of talking about a different branch for each of these videos. So by watching them as kind of a composite series, you'll get kind of the full tree of knowledge about early FPS games, as it were. This is one of the reasons why I might do similar games together, so I can, I can plan what to cover in each of them, and so there's, there's as little overlap as, as possible. I mean, of course, I am going to mention stuff like Quake in the Doom video, and Wolfenstein, but it will just be, you know, it'll be a passing nod. I'm not going to list every single Quake expansion pack and sequel in the Doom video, I'll save that for the Quake video. 
Josh Abner says, I wish my job allowed me to sleep a day away. Some people got it so easy. Hey mate, I bet you get weekends and evenings off. I bet you've even got a guaranteed base income. Talk about having it cushy. Pretty Dean says, Hey Trude, Stu, an upcoming game. I encourage you to watch the trailer if you haven't, and give us your opinion. Do you think it might be a bit... much? I understand it is hypocritical to say so, but uh, perhaps a game that is literally a mass murder simulator is a genre that shouldn't be approached. I have seen the trailer, you know, my name is not important. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Now, I will concede, the violence is shocking. I think it is the sort of game that might make you feel a little bit queasy. But the very fact that it provokes a response means it is worth defending. Absolutely. I mean, if anything, the fact that the violence and hatred provokes a, an emotional response is a good thing. I mean, isn't that better than so many other games which feature mass murder, which provoke no response at all? Like, uh, you know, I've killed tens of thousands of people in Call of Duty, and I never once felt bad for them. Hatred is a game that comes along that finally pokes the bit of the brain that causes empathy, and people are saying, oh my god, this is terrible! So yeah, I think games like Hatred are important. I don't think they're for everybody. I don't think I'd recommend it for everybody to play. I think it might be a bit much for those who are faint of heart, but it's important that games like Hatred exist. I just wish there were games that were pushing sexual boundaries in a similar way. Because there's no decent sex in video games, which is a damn shame. Because, you know, it's a, it's a critical part of the human experience. And yet we completely erase it. It's almost like it doesn't exist. I mean, you play in Skyrim, you come to a village or a town, there's a, a whole bunch of bucks and wenches, and you've got a pocket full of gold coins. You're telling me you couldn't get laid? You could get laid. I can do magic. Darren Chule says, I think the successes of Wasteland 2 and Divinity Original Sin, as well as the way Pillars of Eternity are shaping up, are good indicators that isometric RPGs aren't quite dead yet. Full disclosure, I did indeed contribute to the Kickstarters for all three games. Well, dare I say, I think the fact that all three of these games had to resort to Kickstarter to, to get funded is probably a fairly good indicator that the genre is commercially dead. Or at the very least, it's, you know, some distance from the mainstream. But, you know, I'm not trying to tell you what to enjoy. Not, I'm not going to tell you what not to fund on Kickstarter. And nothing's ever truly dead. I mean, heck. There are people who still play Quake Live. Cubes in a Nutshell says, DRM isn't a necessary evil, it's just evil. Capitalism isn't a necessary evil, it's just evil. Having to buy goods and services isn't a necessary evil, it's just evil. I mean, look, nobody likes DRM, but come on. Evil? Really? Evil? Like, like Satan evil? Anyway, the real question is, is there a better way than DRM to limit piracy on digital goods? Uh, the answer is... perhaps. Depends on how much you like free-to-play games. Depends on how much you like pay-to-win. Depends on how much you like always online. But Stu, I hear you say, some companies offer DRM free, and I always buy their games. So clearly, if companies just offer DRM free offerings, they'd actually get more sales. Interesting theory. And companies that offer DRM-free games, it's commendable. It is commendable, but it's a huge risk. And you can bet when The Witcher 3 comes out, which uh, through GOG.com will be DRM-free, you can bet it will top the most pirated games. Now, to be fair, it probably still would, even if it had DRM. It really doesn't take that long for stuff to be cracked these days. But this is the frontier of the digital economy. And piracy is a problem. I'm not really, you know, complaining or campaigning for anything. I mean, go ahead and pirate games, I don't care. But I think we can probably expect to see some changes to the industry over the next 10, 20 years. In the console space, at least, I can definitely see the retail paradigm disintegrating and being replaced with uh, subscription services. Like Netflix, but for games. But there are technical problems associated with that. Games these days are like 50 gigabytes, they're huge. You can't make it so you can just have a menu of games, select one, and expect it to play instantly. So there might need to be some technical tricks 
to uh, maybe bring down the size of games, or at least offload or share some of that library space. But anyway, I've gone off on a tangent. Frito Bandito 858 says, Dead Space 2 is one of the greatest games ever created. You know, the logician in me can't argue with that. But, you know, by the same logic, uh, Bad Rats is one of the greatest games ever created. Secret of the Magic Crystal, one of the greatest games ever created. You get the idea. Good Friends Forever says, Jeez, people still play Call of Duty. Wow, check out how cool this guy is. He knows so much about video games that he knows Call of Duty is a terrible game. In fact, it's one of the worst games ever created. And so confident in his knowledge that he doesn't even need to stay up with trends or know that Call of Duty is still a popular game. He knows it's still a popular game. He's just trying to look cool. I can see right through you, good friends forever. You're not cool. You're nothing but a poser. Anyway, I'm going to go back to work. I've got a load of stuff to do. Up next is a five-part graphic special, which may or may not be good. It'll probably be all right, at least. It might start coming out next week, but that depends on how far along I am with it. I am planning to release them one video a day for five days, which, you know, should be exciting. It's a nice pace of videos. And then after that, during that, I'll be starting to work with Call of Duty, and I'll do a short five or six-part series on that. Exciting times. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you next week.